Changeling and the letters spelled in serial. One night, when Liza went to bed, Patrick was her chubby, stubby, candy-grubbing, and pancake-loving younger brother who irritated and amused her both. And the next morning, when she woke up, he was not. She could not describe the difference. He looked the same and was wearing the same pair of ratty space alien pajamas with the same fat toe sticking out of the hole in the left foot of his red socks. And he came down the stairs exactly the same way the real Patrick would have done. Bump, 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 sliding on his rump. But he was not the same. In fact, he was quite, quite different. It was something in the way he looked at her. It was as though someone had reached behind his eyes and wrung away all the sparkle. He walked quietly, too quietly, to the table, sat nicely in his chair, and placed a napkin on his lap. The real Patrick never used a napkin. Nobody else noticed a thing. Mrs. Elston, Liza's mother, continued sorting through the stack of bills on the kitchen table, making occasional noises of unhappiness. Liza's father continued passing in and out of the room, his tie unknotted and wearing only one sock, muttering distractedly to himself. The fake Patrick picked up his spoon and gave Liza a look that chilled her to her very center. Then the fake Patrick be began to eat his cereal, methodically, slowly, fishing all the alphabet letters out of his alphabets one by one and lining them up along the rim of his bowl. Liza's heart sank. She knew at that moment what had happened, as well as she knew that the sky was up and the ground was down, and if you turned around fast enough in a circle and then stood still, the world would keep turning the circle for you. Patrick's soul had been taken by the spindlers, and they had left this thing, this not younger brother, in its place. Mom, she said, and then when her mother did not immediately respond, tried again a little louder. Mom? Hmm? Mrs. Elston jumped. She squinted at Liza for a moment, the same way she had looked at the instruction sheet that came along with the easy assemble coffee table in Mahogany, the one she had had to return to the store after she could not figure out how to screw the legs on. Patrick's being weird, Liza said. Mrs. Elston stared blankly at her daughter. Then she whirled around suddenly to her husband. Did you ever pay the electric bill? Mr. Elston didn't seem to hear her. Have you seen my glasses? He asked, lifting the fruit bowl and peering underneath it. They're on your head. Not those glasses, my reading glasses. Mrs. Elston sighed. It says this is our final notice. I don't remember our first notice. Didn't we pay the electric bill? I could have sworn. I can't go to work without my glasses. Mr. Elston opened the refrigerator, stared at its contents, closed the refrigerator, and rushed out of the room. Across the table, the fake Patrick began rearranging the serial letters on the outside of his bowl. He spelled out three words. I hate you. Then he folded his hands and stared at her with that strangely vacant look, as though the black part of his eyes had eaten up all the color. Liza's insides shivered again. She slid off her chair and went over to her mother. She tugged at the sleeve of her mother's nightgown, which had a small coffee stain at its elbow. Mommy. Yes, princess? She asked distractedly. Patrick's freaking me out. Patrick, Mrs. Elston said, without looking up from her notepad, on which she was now scribbling various figures. Stop bothering your sister. Here's what the real Patrick would have done. He would have stuck out his tongue, or thrown his napkin at Liza in retaliation, or he would have said, it's her face that's a bother. But this imposter did none of those things. The imposter just stared quietly at Liza and smiled. His teeth looked very white. Mom, Liza insisted, and her mother sighed and threw down her pencil with so much force that it bounced. Please, Liza, she said with barely concealed impatience. Can you see that I'm busy? Why don't you go outside and play for a bit? Liza knew better than to argue with her mother when she was in a mood. So she went outside. It was a hot and hazy morning, far too hot for late April. She was hoping to see one of the neighbors out doing something, watering a plant, walking a dog, but it was very still. Liza almost never saw the neighbors. It was not that kind of neighborhood. She didn't even know most of their names. Only Mrs. Kostenblatt, who was so old, she looked exactly like a prune. Today, as on most days, Mrs. Kostenblatt was sitting on her porch, rocking, and fanning herself with one of the Chinese delivery menus that were often stuck, mysteriously, invisibly, in the middle of the night, under the front door. Hello, she called out to Liza and waved. Hello, Liza called back. She liked Mrs. Kostenblatt, even though Mrs. Kostenblatt hardly ever moved except to rock in her chair and could not be counted on to do anything interesting. Would you like a glass of lemonade, Mrs. Kostenblatt called out, or a cookie? 
She offered Liza lemonade and a cookie every time they saw each other, unless it was winter, in which case she offered hot chocolate and a cookie. Mrs. Kostenblatt liked to rock even in cold weather, and she would appear on her porch, so bundled in blankets and scarves, she looked like an overstuffed coat rack. Not today, thank you, Liza said regretfully, as she always did. She was not allowed to accept things to eat or drink from non-family members. Liza often wished the rule applied to family members instead. She would much rather have had one of Mrs. Kostenblatt's cookies than her Aunt Virginia's tuna casserole. She wondered whether she should tell Mrs. Kostenblatt about Patrick, but decided against it. Two weeks earlier at recess, when she had tried to tell Christina Millicent and Emma Wong about the spindlers and the constant threat they posed, they had laughed at her and called her a liar. Mrs. Kostenblatt was a good listener, partly, Liza thought, because she couldn't hear very well, but Liza didn't want to risk it. There was only one thing that Liza hated more than liars and that was being accused of being one. At one edge of the yard, a pile of pine cones had been neatly stacked. Liza had arranged them this way only yesterday, thinking that she and Patrick might play a round of pine cone bowling in the morning. But of course she could not play with a false Patrick. He would no doubt find a way to cheat. She had a sudden, wrenching, fierce desire for Anna, her old babysitter, to come home. She would have played pine cone bowling. In fact, she had invented it. Last fall, Anna had gone away to college, which meant that she had moved and couldn't babysit anymore. And instead, Liza and Patrick were left with Mandy, who always chewed her gum too loudly and didn't like to play games. She didn't like anything, really, except talking on the phone. Anna had come over to babysit several times during her Christmas vacation, but on her spring break, she had gone away with her friends. Liza and Patrick had gotten a water-warped postcard from her, but most of the writing had been too blurry to read. In addition to the postcard she had sent from the beach, She had sent two letters from college and a white sweatshirt with a fierce-looking bear on the front, explaining in the attached note that it was her school's mascot. Patrick had cried like a baby when it turned out the sweatshirt was in Liza's size, and she had finally lent it to him. He had promptly spilled tomato sauce on it, and she'd refused to speak to him for an entire day. Liza knew it was stupid, but sometimes she fantasized that Anna would turn up again and confess her deepest secret that Liza and Patrick were, in fact, her siblings, and they had all been torn apart by some horrible event when they were little and forced into different families. Liza's fantasies were a little hazy after that point, but she thought that somehow she, Anna, and Patrick would end up on a long journey together, hunting down some of the magical creatures Anna had always told them about, like gnomes and nymphids, who were beautiful but bad-tempered. Liza sighed. Anna would have known what to do about the spindlers. She was, after all, the person who had first told Liza and Patrick about them. She was the one who had warned them about the strange spider creatures and had told them what they must do to be protected. Liza scanned the yard for gnomes but saw nothing. Only last week, Patrick, the real Patrick, had spotted one scampering into the rhododendron. Look, Liza, he'd cried out, and she'd turned just in time to see a hard brown hide which was as cracked and weathered as a leather purse. It was too hot for the gnomes today, Liza decided. Anna had told Liza that they preferred cool climates. Liza pressed her face up against the small fir tree that stood next to the birdbath, inhaling deeply. It was easier to see the magic through its branches, she found. The scratchy needles poked deeply into her skin, and she stood and squinted through the layers of green. Looking at the world through the fir tree meant seeing only the essential things, the vivid green of the grass, dew glistening on petals, a robin flicking its tail, a squirrel rustling through the rhododendron, a miracle of life and growth that forever pulsed under the ordinariness. And of course, it was only when looking through the tree that you could make a wish and have it come true. Anna had also told them that. Liza spoke a wish quietly into the scratchy branches. We will not repeat it. Everyone knows that only wishes that are kept secret will ever come true. But know this, the wish was about Patrick. Liza heard a step behind her. She turned and saw the Patrick who was not Patrick, standing on the front porch, watching her. Liza sucked in a deep breath, gathered her courage, and said, You are not my brother. Not Patrick stared at her with flat blue eyes. Yes, I am, he said calmly. You aren't. Am too. Prove it, Liza said, crossing her arms, and she tried to think of a question whose answer only the real Patrick would know. She was quiet for a bit. At last, she asked, When you're playing hide-and-seek on a rainy day, what is the best hiding space? Behind the bookcase in the basement, not Patrick answered automatically, in the crawl space that smells like mold. Liza was disappointed. He had gotten it right. This fake Patrick was obviously smarter than she gave him credit for. Smarter, she wouldn't wonder, than the real Patrick. 
Though that wasn't saying much. Only a week ago, the real Patrick had tried to turn the basement into a swimming pool by flooding the sink. Absurd. Maybe she needed to ask a harder question. What must you do every night before you go to sleep, Liza said, eyeing the not Patrick narrowly to see whether there was any hesitation or shiftiness in his answer. But he responded promptly, drawing a big X across his chest. You must cross yourself once from shoulder to hip and say out loud, sweep, sweep, bring me sleep, clear the webs from my room with the bristliest broom. Liza was stunned. She had been sure, positive, that the question would baffle not Patrick, but his answer was correct, and he stood looking at her with an expression of triumph. When Anna had first discovered the spindler, she had invented this rhyme as a way of keeping them at bay while they slept. Everyone knows there is nothing a spider fears more than a broom, and someone sweeping with it, and the broom charm had, in fact, protected them for years. Patrick, the real Patrick, must have forgotten to say the broom charm last night before he went to sleep. He and Liza had been fighting, Patrick had accused her of stealing his favorite socks, which were blue and embroidered with turtles, as though she would have ever worn something so ridiculous, and Liza called him paranoid, and when he did not know what that meant, he stormed into his room and slammed the door. He was distracted. That must be why he had not said the broom charm. Liza felt a heavy rush of guilt. It was her fault, at least partially. And so the spindlers had gotten him. They had dropped down from the ceiling on their glistening webs of shadowed darkness and dropped their silken threads in his ear and extracted his soul slowly, like a fisherman coaxing a trout from the water on a taut nylon fishing line. In its place they deposited their eggs, then they withdrew to their shadowed dark corners and their underground lairs with his soul bound closely in silver thread. And the soulless shell would wake the next morning and walk and talk as not Patrick was walking and talking but eventually the soulless shell would crumble to dust and a thousand spindlers nested and grown would burst forth like a lizard hatching from an egg. And distraught parents would wake up believing their children to have been kidnapped while they slept and they would appear tearfully on television begging for their children's safe return when really the spindlers were to blame. Liza felt a sudden tightness in her throat. You see, not Patrick Crowed, I told you I am your brother. Then Liza was struck by an idea. Come here, she said to not Patrick, and even though she was filled with revulsion by the closeness of this imitation, this cold and cardboard thing, she forced herself to stand still as he approached. Suddenly she lunged for him and began tickling his stomach. The real Patrick was extraordinarily ticklish and would have screamed with laughter and tried to shove Liza off and begged for mercy. Liza loved the sound of Patrick's laugh. It came in short, explosive bursts, as though each time he was relearning how to do it. This Patrick stood still, watching her dully. What are you doing? he asked. Liza pulled away. She then had the same feeling she'd had several years ago when she had swung too high and too fast on the swings at the playground and the world teetered underneath her. A feeling of triumph, but also of terror. She knew it. This Patrick was not the real Patrick. And that meant that the soul of the real Patrick had been bound up in silver thread and carried deep underground. And that inside the body of not Patrick, Insects were nesting. Liza drew herself up to her full four feet four inches. I am not afraid of you, she said to not Patrick, but she was of course speaking to all those infant spindlers sleeping soundly in their thousands of soft eggs somewhere deep inside his chest. And of course she was afraid. She was more afraid than she had ever been in her whole life. I will find my real brother and I will bring him back. And then she spun quickly on her heel and stalked off towards the house so not Patrick and the tiny monsters he carried inside him would not see that she was shaking. Chapter two, several falsehoods and one broomstick. All afternoon, Liza tried to remember what Anna had told her about spindlers. She thought about asking her mother where, whether she still had Anna's cell phone number, but at the last minute decided against it. What if Anna was busy doing something important and got angry when Liza called? Worse, what if she didn't remember Liza at all? Instead, she got out a notebook and made a little list for herself. Everything I know about spindlers and their habits. Spindlers were not like regular spiders. They had eight legs, of course, but at the end of their legs they had human hands. And they had only two eyes, like a person's, although their eyes were enormous and crescent-shaped, and they could see perfectly well in even the darkest night. Furthermore, though they, though they were often as small as a pinhead, they could quite easily swell to the size of a house cat or larger. Some of the largest spindlers could grow to the size of a car, and in their large jawed mouths they had 100 teeth, each as sharp as a fang. 
She did not know what the Spindlers did with the souls that they stole. Anna had claimed that she did not know either, although Liza had never quite believed her. Anna had always gone white when Liza mentioned them, as though someone had just punctured her chin and drained all the color from her face. She did know that Spindlers were practically indestructible. Even brooms would not kill them. She did not know how to kill a Spindler, or whether it was even possible, and that frightened her. That night, she washed her face and put on her pajamas and brushed her teeth, standing as far as possible from not Patrick, who brushed his teeth dutifully beside her. Another thing, the real Patrick, who despised brushing his teeth and used as many tricks as possible to get out of it, would not have done. Both of them were now pretending that everything was back to normal. It was a game they had entered into by silent agreement. Liza pretended not to know that Patrick was not really Patrick, and Patrick pretended both that he was himself and that Liza believed that he was himself. It was a difficult game, but fortunately, Liza was used to playing games with her brother. Will you tell me a story, the not Patrick asked, as the real Patrick might have, after they had both rinsed and placed their toothbrushes side by side in the toothbrush stand? Liza was careful to swivel her bristles away from his so they would not be touching. Not tonight, Liza said, struggling to keep her voice normal and cheerful. Liza often snuck into the real Patrick's room and told him stories late into the night. Why not? He stared at her with large, hollow eyes. Liza knew what he was doing. He was trying to lure her into his bedroom where the spindlers would be waiting, hundreds of them, to steal her soul as soon as she closed her eyes. I'm too tired tonight, she said. Maybe tomorrow night. Not Patrick shrugged. Fine, he said, his eyes flashing angrily. I didn't want to hear one of your stories anyway. Liza thought about the letters lined up on the rim of his bowl this morning. I hate you. She thought, too, of their argument last night and how it was her fault that Patrick had forgotten to say the broom charm. And yet only yesterday Patrick had run up to her laughing, cupping a tiny rose-colored newt in his muddy palms, and asked her whether they could keep it together as a pet. And in that second, her hatred for the spindlers was so intense, she had to grip tightly to the porcelain sink. She waited until he had gone into his bedroom and closed the door. Then she shoved her feet into a pair of her favorite sneakers without bothering to put on socks and padded carefully down the broad, carpeted stairs into the living room. For a moment, she paused, listening to her parents' muffled voices. They were in the den. It'll be all right, her father was saying. Her mother responded, and now you'll need new glasses, and Liza will need braces in the fall, and we never fix that leak in the basement. Liza continued through the kitchen and to the small pantry, where her parents kept rolls and rolls of paper towels, bottles of ketchup, and cleaning supplies. She found the broom and returned down the hallway. She needed a plan, and she was so busy thinking of one, she forgot to dodge the creaky floorboard just next to the hall table. She knew at once she had been too loud. Her parents went silent, and a moment later the door to the den swung open, and a triangle of blue light appeared in the hallway. Liza, her mother called to her, is that you? Liza came forward obediently, clutching the broom. What on earth are you doing, Mrs. Elston said. Why aren't you in bed? She was standing in the doorway of the den, and there was a small, dark crease between her eyebrows, like a tiny exclamation point. There was often an exclamation point between her eyebrows, and Liza liked to imagine invisible words written before it. Liza, please, just give me a second. You're driving me crazy. All these words were implied by that little black crease. Behind her, Liza's father was holding his book at arm's length since he had not found his reading glasses, despite his insistence that they could not just get up and walk on their own. Liza took a deep breath. She had been told repeatedly by her parents that it was wrong to lie, so she said, I'm going to find Patrick. Patrick? What do you mean? Isn't he in bed? Liza explained, the pretend Patrick is in bed. I'm going to find the real Patrick. Mrs. Elston rubbed her eyes. Please, Liza, I'm begging you, don't start this now. It's past your bedtime. Put the broom where you found it and go to your room. I need the broom, Liza insisted. She did not like to be so much trouble to her mother, but it would be insanely impractical to try to launch a sneak attack on a mass of spindlers without at least a broom handy to frighten them off. And Liza was both very sane and extremely practical. Spindlers are afraid of brooms. They'll leave me alone if they see I'm carrying one. At least, I hope they will. A shiver of fear zipped up her spine and she clutched tightly to the broom handle. Spinners, Mrs. Elston repeated, and the exclamation point danced up and down. What on earth are you talking about? Not spinners, spindlers. Liza said the word slowly so her mother would be sure to understand. Spider people who live underground. They're the ones who've got Patrick. For a moment, Mrs. Elston did not say anything. She drew her mouth into a thin white line 
And this reminded Liza of many things, none of them pleasant. Of ruled note paper on which she was expecting to write boring things at school, of rulers and long marches through endless hallways and walls everywhere she looked. Then Mrs. Elston's face seemed to collapse like a balloon deflating. She said in a tired voice, Liza, we've talked about your stories before, haven't we? Liza was not fooled by the quietness. She shifted her weight from foot to foot. Yes. And what have we said? The tiredness was even worse, Liza thought, than anger. The tiredness seemed to say, I have nearly had enough of you. We said that I'm not supposed to, Lila, Liza said. Not supposed to what? Mrs. Elston prompted her. Not supposed to make up stories, Liza said and swallowed. She was gripped in an agony of humiliation. It felt like a giant fist was squeezing her from all sides. She wished fervently that Anna would come back right then in that second. She would push open the door, her long blonde braids swinging down her back. Anna knew. Anna understood. She and Patrick were the only two people Liza had ever met who knew, really believed, that the real wor world was not just grocery stores and park playgrounds, textbooks and toilet paper. They knew that it was gnomes and spindlers and different worlds, too. And why is that, Mrs. Elston said. Liza swallowed hard. Because I'm too old. She gripped the broom handle. She shifted from right to left. She imagined she was skating. Exactly, Mrs. Elston said. Go put away the broom, tuck yourself into bed, and go to sleep like a good girl. She turned to Mr. Elston. Robert, a little help? Mr. Elston finally looked up from his book. He squinted at Liza from across the room. Listen to your mother, Liza, he said, and returned to his book. It was too much. That was the problem with grown-ups. They told you not to lie, and then got angry when you told the truth. It was not fair. Liza burst out, but I'm not making it up. The spindlers really did take Patrick. That thing in his bed, it's not really him. It only looks like him. I told you so this morning, and you didn't listen, and I knew you wouldn't listen because you never listen, which is why I'm going to look for him myself. Liza shut her mouth quickly, feeling breathless. She knew at once she'd gone too far. She never raised her voice to her mother, ever. The color drained from Mrs. Elston's face as though someone had just filled her to the brim with milk. You're very bad to speak to me that way, Liza, she said sadly. Liza felt a flare of guilt, and she tried to squash it by feeling angry again, but she couldn't. She could only feel guilty and then sorry for herself and sorry for her mother and sorry that she'd made her mother sorry and then guilty again. Now go to your room, Mrs. Elston said quietly. We'll talk about this in the morning. Liza squeezed the broom handle, turned, and ran up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, she paused. Her heart was drumming in her chest, and it seemed to echo the words still running endlessly through her mind. Not fair, not fair, not fair. The only light came from a small, single nightlight, which burned just outside the bathroom and cast a faint red circular glow on the carpet. She could turn left and go down the hall to her own bedroom and curl up safely in bed with the broom next to her footboard and sleep safely and soundly as her mother surely would have wanted her to do. Or she could turn right and go down the hallway in the other direction to her brother's room and she could keep watch over the monster and see if she could find out what had happened to the real Patrick. I am not afraid, Liza said quietly to herself and forced her body to turn to the right. I am not afraid, she repeated and took one step and then another. She was alarmed by how quickly she came to Patrick's door, with its smudgy door handle and various scrawled pictures of alien ships and underwater animals taped to it. I can still go back, thought Liza. I can look for the real Patrick tomorrow. But she knew that tomorrow might be too late. Instead, she reached out and grabbed the doorknob. Then she eased open the door and slipped into the blackness of her brother's room. It was perfectly quiet except for the heavy pounding of Liza's heart. The normal Patrick would have been snoring loudly and snuffling and rustling about in his bed. Liza could hardly stand to share a bed with him when they went on vacations. He would kick and toss all evening. But the not Patrick slept soundlessly and in perfect stillness like a stone. Liza reminded herself that he might as well have been a stone. Soon he would break apart completely and there would be no hope for his rescue. The warm, glowing center of him, the live thing, was no doubt buried somewhere deep underground by now. Liza knew she had no choice. She, too, must go below. Chapter 3, The Basement During the day, Liza liked the basement. She and Patrick often played hide-and-seek among the large boxes, which were full of old sweaters and yellowing books and broken toys and other interesting things. When it rained, there was a leak in the corner, just above the old yellowing map, 
which was warped and bubbled from moisture, and which depicted cities and countries that had long ago ceased to exist. Then Mr. Elston would have to come stomping and cursing to set up a bucket between the boxes. But in the night, it was very different. Liza had waited until both of her parents had gone to bed. Then she'd slipped on a long-sleeved shirt and her favorite puffy vest over her pajamas and made her way as quietly as possible to the door next to the kitchen and then down the rough wooden stairs that led into the basement. Everything looked strange and sharp and unfamiliar. The piles and boxes were people wearing cloaks of darkness. Any of them might jump out and grab her. Liza was desperately tempted to turn on the light. But then, of course, the spindlers would know she was coming. Liza thought she heard something rustle behind her and she spun around, clutching the broom with both hands like a baseball bat. But no, there was nothing. Liza lowered the broom. There it was again. Liza paused, listening. Faintly, she could detect the sounds of scratching and scrabbling coming from her right. She took one shuffling step in that direction and then another. Despite the hours and hours she had spent playing in the basement, she felt very turned around. She had the sense that the room was growing bigger all around her, extending outward in strange and twisty ways, like a tightly closed flower suddenly opening its petals. She bumped her knee against a hard corner and said, Krill, quietly into the dark. Krill was her word for when things were going badly. She reached out and moved her hand along the object blocking her path. She recognized the carvings along its surface as belonging to a large wooden trunk in which her mother kept woolen sweaters. This helped orient her, and Liza took several more steps forward, more confidently this time. She kept the broom in front of her and swept from side to side so she could be sure that the path was clear and she would not trip and fall over anything. She thought if she were to break her neck and die, and then Patrick, the fake one, were to crumble to dust when the spindlers overtook him, their parents would be extremely sorry and regret that they had accused Liza of making up stories. The idea was somewhat pleasing and helped her focus on something other than the fear and the scratching sounds of so many tiny nails which were growing louder by the second. At last, she stood in front of the narrow bookcase that concealed the hole in the wall that was a crawl space, the best place for hiding during games of hide and seek. Behind the bookcase, the sounds of scratching and clicking were louder than ever. Liza thought of her warm bed upstairs and the orderliness of her room, with her pink and white striped chair and the dollhouse she never played with anymore but still enjoyed looking at, pretty and peak-roofed and painted white. Inside the dollhouse were figures of a father and a mother and a brother and a sister with smiles painted on their faces, sitting happily around a miniature dining room table topped with a bowl of miniature fake fruit. There was no basement in the dollhouse. There were no spindlers there either. But the dollhouse was not real life, and Liza knew that, as we have already established. She was a very practical girl. She turned and gave a final glance behind her. The basement appeared vast and black, as though it had been consumed by a fog. She could make out nothing but the very barest outlines of dark shapes in the mist. She turned back toward the bookcase. She placed the broom carefully on the ground by her feet. Then, using both hands, she shoved and wiggled and inched the bookcase along the wooden floor until slowly the hole in the wall was revealed. This, too, appeared to have grown larger. Normally, Liza had to double forward and squeeze herself into into the crawl space when she wanted to hide, and even then she had to be careful not to move around too much, or she would bang her elbows on the walls or her head on the ceiling. But now she stood at the edge of an enormous, gaping circle, twice as tall as she was. She could see nothing but a few feet of rough dirt pathway. Beyond that, everything was blackness. She heard a howling wind that seemed to be blowing from somewhere miles and miles away. It carried with it strange smells that reminded Liza of very old paper and the mud that clogged the storm drains in the spring. She bent down, retrieved her broom, and walked forward into the hole. The ground beneath her feet was crisscrossed with faint silvery threads all pulsing faintly in the dark, as if illuminated by a strange evil energy. There could be no doubt that the spindlers had been here. This must be how they came in and out, up and down. Liza took only a few steps before the darkness swallowed her completely. The air was cold and damp and weighed on her like a terrible sweaty hand. The smell of mud and decay grew stronger and fouler as the ground sloped steeply downward. She went slowly, gropingly forward, terrified that at any second she would trip and fall and be sent into a wild hurdle into black space. She had the sense of walls pressing down on her, but when she swept from side to side with her broom, she encountered no resistance, nothing but air. Then, from her left, she heard the unmistakable sounds of scratching, louder, much louder than she had thought possible, bigger. Liza froze. 
Fear drove through her and iciness in her veins. She gripped the broom so tightly in her hands her knuckles began to ache. Now the scratching was on her right. Closer. Closer. Behind her. Just like that, the terror that was ice in her veins became a gushing tidal wave and Liza began to run. She ran blindly through the dark, her heart scrabbling into her throat, suppressing a cry of terror, stumbling over uneven ground. From all around her, above and behind, on her left and her right, came the sound of scratching feet and claws. Then her foot snagged on something hard and Liza tripped and just as she had feared, went hurtling downward into the dark.